This is the If More Let's Divide podcast. Yo guys, um, welcome to the F More Let's Divide podcast. Um, another week, another episode. This week is going to be a dope one because someone I hold in high, high esteem, someone I met a couple of, you know, many years ago. Fred, don't, don't talk. Because I, <laughs> <laughs> For over a decade. decade. <laughs> many years ago, a couple of years ago. Chaya, um, an amazing human being. Spirit so calm, brain so lucid. Um, we have Professor John Collins. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yo, Prof, we thank you for coming through for the podcast. Um, a couple of people have m- mentioned you on the podcast, and I mean, you are one of the people who I had, you know, I, I actually had your name down. Um, but I know your busy schedule, so I was waiting for the right time. And I realized that we actually both go to Tessano Sports Club. You That's know. right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been going to Tessano Sports Club since I was a child. Um, and I still go there to swim and to, you know. I wrote a book there once. Oh, really? Mm. A whole book? Yeah, a science fiction book. Oh, wow. It was during 87 structural adjustment times in Ghana yeah. when I was running a recording studio. The bottom fell out of the economy, so I decided to go to Tesano every morning. Wow. Because the musicians were having a tough time in Ghana coming to find money to, to do sh- studio work. Yeah. You know, so, um, and I sat down and wrote a science fiction story about music. Wow. What's it, what's what was it, it like? called? <laughs> it was called The Power of Music. No, th- th- it, that was another book I wrote um, when I worked with Faisal Helwani. Um, mm. But this one was called The Star Song. Mm. So is it, is it out? No, uh, the, it only, in the end I printed a few copies myself and it became a sort of a book that the Achimota school where my son was, with, with, with some of the students became interested in oh. the book and it sort of made the rounds. Oh wow. So some people did see it. Um, but wow. it, it's a, yeah. When you, so the Tesano, I was going there, I even played at the Tesano club. Oh wow. Yeah, back in the 70s. Yeah. Is it too late to publish? No, no. I mean, my son and his mates at Achimota love the book. Oh, um, oh yeah, because it sounds like something I would love to read. I can send. Oh, I can send you copies of it. Yeah, please. I can send you copies yeah. of both. Please, yeah. Yeah. Got, please. We have three copies. We have yeah. three copies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Charlie, if I, isn't, it, isn't it crazy that you know, like like people who write, even even though I write, even though I'm I'm a poet, like I, I don't I'm, I I don't write books. Like I write like. Have you pages. thought about writing books? No. No. Okay. Well, you can write an anthology of your yeah, poems. Yeah. My yeah. mother was a poet. Oh. And she had lots of separate poems. And in the end, she put them all together into a single book. Mm. Yeah. 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 For, 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 for that, I have thought of. But for something like a science fiction or, you know, sci fi, you know, yeah. history, like, I, mm. I'm not really. You know. I've thought about writing, but I've always found authors that are actually. Maybe doing the genre that I like, mm. I feel like I write in it better than I could. Mm. So then I'm deterred from. I'm like, ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm John. Yeah. Would you do you enjoy watching or you enjoy rereading? Which which one would you prefer? And then why? Which one do you prefer and why? When you say watching, watching like watching the screen, like watching movies, films, like film. documentaries, or um, reading films, reading, you know. I, I, I was an avid reader, um, but. I, I guess now I watch a lot of YouTube or, you know, mm. and look at these very interesting programs on the, yeah. the 12 dimensions and oh, mo- yeah. quantum physics or mm. whatever, or yeah. where is there a soul or not, yeah. Yeah. and what happens after life. I mean, it's, uh, rather than reading books, uh, in fact, if you think about it, books are very linear. I mean, the, you can put them in your pocket, of course, but yeah. a film can give you a, a bigger context because of the mm. video side. Video no. audio information gives you yeah. much more than just yeah. um, reading a book. Mm. Um, but I think uh, in the future, people will forget how to read because everybody will be watching TV or... Yeah, and also AI. AI. Yeah. AI. We, we, we AI. might not need even schools. Like, it, it, it's actually crazy. If yeah. you think about it. Like, we might not even need schools because 
you know, AI is there and would... You could just, yeah, yeah. basically, whatever you want to teach or learn, you can yeah. easily get access to it at your fingertips. Yeah. Um, Fred, you want, or should I? Yeah, I was going to ask, he, he said, so you go, and then I'll, I'll think of the question I wanted to ask him was related I mean, to what it, you asked. It, 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 it's still on, you know, what, what he said. Um, you made mention of, like, what happens after you die, and I know that. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Let me. Is, I, I, know, a, I know this. This isn't why you came here. Yeah. I'm not a priest anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, right? <laughs> if I pray, <laughs> actually pray. <laughs> what happens after we die? Because I'm asking you this to get get get, get your view. I've been bantering with people about this like is there life after death for me i think there is nothing after death once we die we lose our consciousness and we don't know what's up because let's go to the bible even though christian i'm, I'm not a christian now i was born in a christian home and all that how you came is the same way you would leave i i don't remember my first day on earth i don't even remember like like so why do you expect me to see that I'm dead and yeah, I'm dead and I'm lying there and you know, it's, it's all a, a fart to me. How do you see, you know? Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I, in some ways I agree with you and, and in some ways I have a slightly different idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know that scientists have now discovered, you know that we live in a, a world of three dimensions in time, which yeah. makes four. Yeah. But in fact, they now believe that the universe contains 11 dimensions. Wow. Uh, I won't go into the reasons. Mm -hmm. It's to do with quantum mechanics and so on. Now, what I believe in is what they call the block universe. That the universe, maybe I'll make, make it easier. Yeah. Supposing you have a cosmic book mm -hmm. and the whole history of the universe, 13 billion years of history, the origins of human beings, evolution is all in that book, including us. It does, when we die, I don't think our individual soul goes into an afterlife. I think what we, we are written into this universal book, which God or the, uh, whatever you want to call that, the supreme being or the, the 12th dimensional God or whatever, can look at your page and you're always there. Mm. You, never, you, are, you actually become immortal by becoming mm. a, a human being and conscious. Mm. But you don't, doesn't mean you actually have an afterlife. You become part of a, a God's book or a cosmic book yeah. in, and you, the, you can turn the pages and maybe your one line on one page, you know, could be billions of pages. Yeah. So you, you don't have to strive for immortality. We are automatically immortal. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a take I've never... Um, actually, I read a bit about it, but I didn't quite go in this direction. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting perspective to have because if you're a person of faith, a lot of times your your uh, orientation is that there's a life after death and you strive to be a, a better human being. Even though I consider myself a Christian, I've always struggled with the idea of doing good for the sake of pleasing god to to be rewarded for it like mm. what is why can't you just be good for the sake of being good yeah and then let the you know results play out as they may because i think it's a complex issue but it's an interesting point that you you bring up because i have i've never really thought about it that way that we could just be maybe a line in a book yeah. being written by yeah. you the, know the creator, the, the, or, the creator. Or, or, but i i can only say this uh, because i have knowledge of physics Yes. And higher dimensions. Yes. Um, so it's a higher dimensional book, which is the beginning and the end of the universe, which you could call God if you like. Yeah. And once you're there, every star, every human being, every ant is there. Have you read God's Debris? No, I haven't. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting book. It kind of goes in that line of thinking. Okay. Uh, God's De You read them? No, no. Okay, it's an interesting book. Maybe mm -hmm. I want to check it out. Okay. Um, um, Prof, um, how would you de de describe yourself as in what you do? Well, okay, um, I, st I started as a scientist, you know. Really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't yes. know this. This is one of the reasons I always get on well with Panji. Panji. 
Shouts to Fanji. Mm. Because we both started as scientists. Yeah. He went into engineering, engineering yeah. and I went into uh, biology and so on, uh, chemistry. I was, you know, I was teaching chemistry at oh. GIS oh. for eight, seven years. Oh. So I was a science teacher. Um, wow. Then I went into the social sciences when I came to Ghana as a, as a student doing archaeology and anthropology, sociology. Mm. And then I got stolen by music. <laughs> and, and so went into perf so I've gone from hard science to social wow. sciences to performing arts. Wow. <laughs> so I, wow. Yeah, I'm just very lucky in my education that I was lucky enough to go through I think this. Now, I, yeah. I think I, I saw somewhere about you teaching in GIs back in the day. Mm. So how did music steal you? Um, well, it actually, um, I was playing in England before I came back to Ghana. I was playing in rock bands um, and jazz. I was in a jazz band with my brother, rock bands, and I was raised on jazz. Oh. My parents, both of them, were what in those days they used to call bohemian. In fact, mm. my mother was a poet. Oh, Even yeah. my dad was a poet oh. before coming to Ghana as a philosopher. Mm. Um, but they were very interested in jazz. And one day um, at school, when I was about six years old, I was asked, all the students, the school kids were asked to give one poem they know. So I got up and said, ashes to ashes, Dust, dust to dust. dust. If the women don't get you, the liquor must. Bars, bars, bars. Wow. I love that. <laughs> See, Is that a poem your mom wrote? Or no, something? it's the beginning of a jazz song by oh. Louis Armstrong. Okay. And so the teacher freaked out and rushed over to see my parents to see what type of people <laughs> they were. And then they had to explain. You live with. Yeah. And wow, bars, bars, bars. <laughs> I, I'm just imagining how startled the, the teacher yeah, must have been. From a little child. Of a how old were you then? Six. <laughs> so I knew about women and liquor. You know. Wow. That's it. That's dope. Of course, I didn't really know anything. But I just, but I just love the song. It's called King of the Zulus okay. by Louis Armstrong. It's a lovely song. Yeah. I'm probably going to play that one on my yeah. way out. Yeah. 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 yeah, King of the Zulus. Yeah. The King mm. of the Zulus. I mean, same yeah. after, after. It's recorded yeah. in 1925, I think. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, I was raised on jazz. I was playing rock music, and rock music was originally called rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. And it was picked up by the whites in the 50s and changed into rock and roll. And then um, when I... So I was already into music. Mm. And my father was a guitarist and a mandolin player. Oh. And I, I discovered that when, when I got to Ghana, I, I came with a guitar. Um, so it was a, a hobby. The only thing is that Legon you had to cover your guitar in cloth so nobody would see it. Mm. Oh, why? It was considered the most disgraceful instrument by certain elitist people. And I once had one wife of one professor of chemistry, chemistry came to my house, my father's house in Legon, saying I'd been corrupting her son because I'd been teaching him guitar. Because wow. it was associated with drinking, drunkenness, mm. womanizing. Palm wine. Mm. Palm wine. Yes, yeah. wow. And mm. it took me... I was, it, uh, you know, Konimo was the guy who introduced the high-life guitar to Kamasi. Kwao Mensa was the guy who introduced the high-life guitar to Cape Coast University. And I was the guy who introduced the high-life guitar to Lagon. Sha, 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 sha. Oh, dope. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dope. And, and, and there were some very annoyed people at Lagon in the music department. What, they considered it like inferior to like say a violin or something? Or a piano, yes. Oh, wow. And um, they said that, okay, I can teach it but I should teach classical guitar, Spanish guitar, or jazz guitar. And I said, no, I've already been taught to play high -like palm wine guitar by people like Ike Nyami and Kwame Mensa and so on, Konimo. So, and this music in Ghana is at least 100 years old. It's fully matured, and it's dying, you know, this is back in the 90s, so the, the, with the burger coming in, the burger high life, and then the hip hop, hip life, a lot of the, that natural music was disappearing. Mm. So I said, we've got to teach the students. So I started with a class of eight, and then we set up a palm wine group at, uh, in the department in, when was it, 1997. And now we have a whole bunch of palm wine groups that have come out of the university playing palm wine guitar. Mm. Because luckily for us, Konimo, myself, and Kwao were getting older. So we can't be considered to be rascals. Yeah, and I was a professor and so on. Yeah. And at the same time, the church was sanctifying the guitar. 
if you think about gospel music. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the, it was already sanctified. So we managed to get the guitar into the system. So even in the 90s, they were considering the guitar an inferior yes, yes. instrument? Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It was beginning to change there, partly because of the gospel music. Okay. So you can see gospel bands. Maybe you can go to heaven, sit on a cloud, and instead of playing a harp, you can play a guitar. Mm. Maybe you plug yourself into the, a thunderbolt for your electricity. But at okay. least the guitar can be played by angels, if you right. see my point. Understood. But before Understood. that, the guitar was considered the lowest type of instrument. And it was only good for vagabonds. And also a lot of the guitarists who were traveling with the concert parties were going from village to village. They were itinerant, so footloose. And in fact, when I was first, you know, my first degree was in archaeology and sociology. So after about three years, I was fully into high life music. So I went to African studies and said, I'd like to do an MA in high life music. And one of the things that they, reasons they gave me why I, I couldn't, it, number one was they thought it was a subject unworthy of academic pursuit. I'm talking about high life in a Ghanaian university. Mm. Um, and then the other reason was that they heard rumors that I used to sleep on the floor with musicians. Well, if you're <laughs> traveling with a band from village to village, there are no hotels. Yeah. And, that's, it was, that's and it was very comfortable. I mean, wow. you, you have a mat, you, put, you, you have a place where you play, um, something like a compound house in a village. That's where you perform. Do your, you put a stage there for the night. Right. So you're very well protected. You're inside a building, a house. But why did that matter towards what you wanted to study or pursue? Well, the, 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 the thing is that the music took over, mm. you know, I found... No, I mean, as in, what, what was your concern with you sleeping on the floor with other musicians? I'd be a bad role model for the students. Oh, as a said. professor, they take all Well, I wasn't things. a professor, I wasn't even a doctor then, of course I was, but... That yeah, was I'm just attitude. amazed at the, the consideration given to that fact, like, what does it matter? In my mind, yeah. I just yeah. can't fathom that, okay, so he hangs out with musicians, so yeah. then what? Well, but I guess in the time and era, it, it was... It was a colonial mentality or, or the elitist mentality, mm. Mm. you know, because Nkrumah had made the great breakthrough in getting traditional African music accepted at the university. Mm. This is why in the music department, we used to call ourselves dondologists. It, mm. was, a, it yeah. was a joke name, but it, in fact... I've heard that term before. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It was because the university was shocked that we'd bring in traditional performers as tutors, you know, lecturers, um, so th that was done by Nkrumah, but, um, um, Kru but unfortunately Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966, <coughs> but Nkrumah's vision of using music for national development or national identity was to use traditional African music, drumming, School of Performing Arts, Arts Council, that type of thing, mm -hmm. African art music, mm -hmm. Ephraim Amu, uh, Amu and uh, Philip Bego, the national anthem, right. and popular music, High Life. He used High Life for national projects. Mm. When he was overthrown, only two of his visions were transmitted into the university. So when oh. I studied at the university, the music students were teaching there. The music students were meant to be bi-musical. That is, um, they could play traditional African drumming, which was a huge breakthrough, that oh. itself you know, after independence, um, or African art music, okay. which is a sort of elitist in a way, you know, you have to be educated and mis missionarized or whatever. Um, but the popular music wasn't, so we were called, the students were meant to come out of the music department, try musical. So what I went in to do was I, I tried to make them try musical. So they asked me to open up the popular music studies, and it was Professor Anidaho, you know, mm, you know, yeah, him? Yeah, yeah, I know. and the people at the top, and they were thinking um, that the f even the foreign students coming to Legon, they want to know about traditional African music. Yeah. They want to know about art music, but they also wanted to know what's going on on the ground now, right. popular music. So they brought me in to open up all that. Um, and the first time they tore up my contract, the second time they sent a demonstration to the registry against me coming into the music department, and they were all squashed wow. by... by people at the top who realized that they have to open up the university to popular music studies. That was in 1995 or 96. Wow, recent. But yeah, that's recent. Yeah, We're recent. like old enough to know. Yes, yeah. and luckily for me, an old friend of mine then became head of the department, 
Willy Anku. And Willy Anku had an open brain and wanted to do studio. That, you know, we, he was the one who put the first recording studio into the universe, into the music department. So we worked together, popular music, recording technology, and changed the department. Mm. So mm. that's how it happened. It was, but all of this was because I'd become so interested in music that even though I couldn't do my MA at Legon, I, it was my, a blessing to me, actually, because it forced me into the society, not into the ivory tower of Legon. Right. So, so, that, so in 1972, I started forming bands and doing mm. research, my own research, and that's how I learned everything. Mm. All my books, they're all... You know, I, I met practically, I wouldn't say everybody, but I, I was one of the founding members of the Musicians' Union of Ghana. I read that. All those types of things. Yeah. So I met everybody. I liked the music, I liked the people. So I wrote, and I noticed that nobody was writing about people like E.K. Nyami, who was a friend of mine, or Kwa Mensa. Mm. So I wrote the histories. Then they got published. So in the end, I mean, the Americans, you know what actually happened was that the Americans were using my books in the 80s, 70s and 80s, as part of the education system in America. So I went mm. to America one year, and they said, oh, are you not a doctor? I said, no, I, I, di I didn't even get an MA. And they said, okay, come to us, we'll give you a shortcut to a, a, a PhD, that is a doctorate, because you're, we have a special program for mature students who have contributed in some way to the educational system. Maybe they don't have the qualifications. So there were some black uh, American poetesses, Native American professors of Native American history, mm. so, who didn't have their professorships or anything like that, but they were given a way into a PhD program because their writings were so important. And that's what they gave me. And I was able mm. to do a PhD, wow. come back to Ghana, and then get into the music wow. department. Um, and then while I was doing this, then um, there was developments going on in Kamasi around Konimo, who's a very old and good friend of mine. And Kwao Mensa was doing, introducing high, at least a high life guitar, and a guy called Bob Pinodo, who I used to run a band with in the 70s. Um, so it wasn't just me, we were coming up at the same time in different universities. And there was even a guy in Nigeria who became my friend, who was doing this similar to us with Nigerian high life. I see. You see? So oh. these things are, were coming up, and at the same time, popular music was being blessed by the churches because of gospel music. Mm -hmm. I mean, gospel music, you could say, is something like a version of high life, yeah. you know, but put sanctified. Yeah. And the same thing was happening in night. So all these forces were legitimizing the guitar as a, a very, I don't know, good status instrument. Gotcha. Yeah. So, but it took a, a long time. It, so, yeah, 90s, that delay was because of the overthrow of Nkrumah. His vision was to put all three types of music from national, for national development and then into the university, and boom, he was taken out in 1966 with the help of the Americans, hmm. the British and the French. Yeah. George Washington of Africa was taken out. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Or possibly, um, possibly. How many books have you written, bro? About 10, I think. 10, uh, okay. I've, I've, a lot of them were biographies. I've written a biography of E.T. Mensa, mm -hmm. of the Jaguar Joke Concert Party, Fela Anikala Bukuti, King Bruce of the Black Beats, and there's another one I've written. Um, and then uh, I just had a book published last week in Ghana about oh. myself. One of my students have written, has written my biography. Oh, oh, that's awesome. terrific! Yeah. So that's terrific yeah. about about your work time, life. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, so it's very it's funny that I've been writing these biographies of so many people, and finally somebody's written my biography. Yeah. Which which is a good segue into what I I wanted to ask you from just reading about you and the work that you've put in. Matumbo and I were discussing before you came on about how vital and instrumental and important the work that you have done is to just our culture in general. And I wanted to ask if you think we have a healthy culture of recording our history, our culture, everything that we experience as a society and how, how in, from your perspective, important it is for nation building or identity. Yeah, yeah um, 
I think certain areas were very well researched as soon as Ghana became independent, or even before, you know, like archaeology, maybe African history, by African scholars, as well as, you know, a few Europeans. But for popular music, popular entertainment, it was put way down on the back burner. Um, so there wasn't any interest. And my, I have several theories about this. One is people didn't think it was worth documenting the great high life artists of the time because Ghanaians are so musical. You know, supposing you're living in a house and you've got electricity is always there, water's always there. You don't think about it. Mm. But the moment Dumso or the water starts, stops, you start to think it's a, a resource yeah. that should be. And it's the same with culture. If you, if you are such a musical people, Ghanaians are extraordinarily musical people as compared to whites. The whites used to be musical people, but now they're musical consumers. I don't mean they're still musical, they will dance or listen to music, but they, the, the number of artists is quite small. Um, whereas when I was first in Ghana, there was literally not a single human being who couldn't sing in a church choir or a traditional drumming group or choral group. Everybody was introduced to music and every person could, would dance. And I think high life was like water. It, in fact, what one producer told me in the 70s, look, you musicians are nothing in Ghana. High life is like water, it's like a tap, I can turn it on and you'll, I can, if you don't obey me or something or take my conditions, I can find more musicians, you're just like water. Yeah. Well, the water also dries up in the end, like everything else. Um, so I think what happened with me is it was just pure luck that I came to Ghana at the time when there were only four people, no, I think three, four, four people in the whole of Ghana, let me give you their names, who were working on High Life when I first came to Ghana. F.O. Sutherland, okay. oh. who became a very good friend of mine through, yes. through my father. Professor Atana Mensah, who was my father's friend. Uh, Professor uh, Bami, who wrote some works on the concert party. And B.T. Casely Hayford, who later became a friend of mine. These were the only Ghanaians who'd done any work on High Life. And I got to know every single one of them. <laughs> um, so, and people like my father was also interested in High Life and so on. Okay. And some people wonder, where did I get all my information from? Well, first of all, I was standing on the shoulders of others. Okay. So there were those few people who could, you know, F.O.S. Sutherland, for instance, I was working with a concert party. So I went to see her, because she used to run a concert party. Right. And she was help, able to help orientate me. Okay. You know? Um, so, that, so that was a very... So at that particular moment, what happened is, is I, as I started to move around Ghana and also Nigeria, because the same thing in Nigeria, I'm talking, it's not just Ghana, Nigeria the same. Yes, yes. Um, I, I started to just simply talk. And it was the music. I didn't go in as a researcher. I never had a research grant. I never went with a, what's a, a, a mission. You know, some people will come with a mission. They're, they're going to document African this or African right, that. Right, right. I'd already been in Ghana before as a child. I was just coming back to see my father and be with my father. So I didn't have a mission to do this. It was just done because I love the music and love the mu musicians. And I was perplexed by why these people weren't written about. <coughs> Look, I had to write the first book on E.T. Mensah. Mm. I mean, why would, or E.K. Nyami, how did I know E.T. Mensah? Because I was staying in a flat in Osu with his ex-singer. How did I meet I don't know, let's say um, E.K. Nyami. Mm -hmm. I was living in Jamestown, just around. It was, a lot of it was just coincidence. People I moved with or worked in with. In the circles of yeah, yeah. what you were doing. And, and I didn't get my history from one person. So I was able to triangulate the different informations I was getting. And so gradually in my head, I was sort of able to work out the sequence mm. of things. Um, and, and I was doing it that, that at the time when nobody else was really doing this. So, so, so later on, people fell on my information. Mm. Which is the why I'm trying to find out if you have any insight as to why we just don't have a general culture of document. Because it's not just in the mm. arts. You know, if you go to sports. Yeah, sports, yeah. yeah like Abedi Pele, uh, Azuma Nelson, all these people. And we still don't have like a place where you can go to yeah, look at yeah. our athletes or the history of what our people have achieved throughout the world. Yeah. And 
or private archives or the music yeah. how people's houses that become museums yeah like yeah. I, I yeah like louis armstrong house in, in new york or whatever yes yes we really don't i mean again they, the the people who do this Ghanaians are so few that i got to know every single one of them and one of course was guy warren kofi oh, ganaba yeah. became a very good friend of mine because we were both sort of musicians who become archivists um um but but I do have a theory about this, but it's, you might find it a bit peculiar. It's to do about the traditional attitude of Africans to time. You see, the concept of linear time, BC, AD, mm -hmm. pr progressive time moving in a line, is something that was invented by the Judaic people, the Christians and the Muslims. Um, because the, the, the Jewish people were the born, uh, chosen of God, um, they thought they had a special destiny and that there would be sort of, his, they sort of invented history for themselves. Now, Africa wasn't operating like that. A Africa was operating on circular time. Mm. India was operating on reincarnation time. So we have a different concept of history being a straight line moving mm. from beginning to end to series of cycles. Now, in, if you have a circular attitude to time, what tended to happen in the olden days in Africa, right. is you will know your father and your grandfather, or your grandmother and grand, uh, mother and grandmother, and maybe possibly you might know one more generation. But in Africa what happened is that you were ancestralized. After the third generation back, mm -hmm. you, be you became an ancestor, yes. or a deity. Yeah. You know, Shango, yeah. for instance, the god Shango in the yeah. Yoruba mythology, wasn't a, he was an actual human being. He was the king of Oyo in the 14th century. So people then become either turned into ancestors or gods. Um, my own feeling is that um, the idea of somebody being in historical time, let's say you, you go back, this guy was born on a certain date, 14th century, 20, you know, whatever it is, then you become, a, uh, in, in historical time, you will go back and maybe examine these people or see what they are doing. But uh, this is just a theory of mine about yeah. that the sense of historical time was not very deep in Africa because after three generations back, you, are, you become an ancestral person, which means you're recycled. Mm -hmm. It forms circles. And the circle, the, 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 so you might have yourself, your grandfather, your father, maybe possibly the founding of your clan, and then you become an ancestor. So, so it... So maybe one of the reasons was that the, the, because you were recycled, you did come back into existence in a way, or parts of you, like, uh, what is it in Ga? You, you call somebody who's um, abib, abib, abibio, ababio. Yeah, yeah. ababio, yeah. Yeah, yeah that sort of thing. So you, you do, so it wasn't nece necessary to really historically place you, because either some bits of the, your ancestors will come in you, or your ancestor had just become an ancestor, mm. you know, without any sort of historical, uh, just a floating in the air. Right, um, right. I think I'm following what you're saying. Like, yeah, yeah. But, but, but of course, everything has changed because Ghanaians have now become, believing in linear time, historical time. Um, I'm only trying to think one possible argument because I, I've noticed it myself that we, there are no, all the great houses, where E.T. Mensah, or look at this place, um, Seaview Hotel, all yeah. these great places, I just pulled down. Mm -hmm. Nobody gives a damn about them. Uh, these were historic. Ha the place I lived in was um, a, a, a musical house, was called Temple House, opposite yeah. Piccadilly Biscuit Factory, you know, and there were important dances going on there in the 1920s and so on. So all these things are being pulled down, um, and people just don't want to know about history. And I, I've often been amazed by the lack of interest in history of the local society, not history in history books, but why nobody is, I don't, treasuring these heroes. Mm -hmm. So I came in with a European historical sense of time, so I felt I must write these stories down. Yes, yes, you know? yes. And, and maybe now, of course, I don't have to do it because so many Ghanaians are writing their own histories. Oh, they are now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, good. Oh, yes. I mean, you're doing it right now. Yeah. In a yeah. way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in a way we're documenting. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting perspective that you've given me 
because I've always lamented the lack of, and I think the idea of, you know, patriotism and who you are comes from being able to read about yourself, your history, yeah. what your people have accomplished, the evolution of many things from, for a, a, a random example could be Picasso saying he invented cubism. Right. When the art form already existed here. But if it was being documented, mm -hmm. for instance, then it would be hard for somebody else to lay claim to it and say, I invented this if the history establishes that, that oh, yeah. these artists yeah. already were mm. doing it before you came yeah. in. So yeah. maybe... Yeah. Well, it might be something to do with individualism mm. as well. The heightened sense of individualism in the West. Right. I, I would even call it aggressive individualism. Um, is... Let me give you an example. A master drummer in a traditional African drumming group, a West African drumming group, um, was not an egoist. Mm -hmm. the, the, the music didn't revo re result or revolve around the master drummer. He was the person who created the musical machine with all the bits and pieces and makes sure the thing is moving. But of course it moves in cycles anyway, right. you know, uh, timelines and so on. Um, so the emphasis on African creativity was not the individual, and in fact, it, there are some African societies and third world societies where it would even be considered to be hubris for you to say that you invented this song. Because some people say it came in a dream. Mm. Some people say angels brought the, dream, the yes. music, or your ancestors gave it yes. to you. So the emphasis in Western society, it goes with this sense of historical time, is an overblown sense of individualism. And then, of course, with that comes the whole concept of copyright. Africans didn't have copyright. They, they did have the ownership of certain songs by certain cults, mm -hmm. you know, religious cults, right. or secret societies. But so you get a whole bunch of things that go with colonization of Africa in terms of culture. I'm not saying they're negative or positive, but yes. they were different from the African system, which is that you don't need a, a great sense of historical time <coughs> because basically after about three or four generations you become ancestral figures. Mm -hmm. But you can still become very important for your national identity of those times. The totem of your abusua, your yeah. abusua, yeah. your totem animal or clan. Yeah. You can even become an animal through your ancestral connections. Yes. yes. So it still holds the society together. But you can't pinpoint the details of those ancestral figures. Mm. Because again, you need maybe writing and things like this. Um, but with the, the Jewish people starting when the, the Bible was turned into Greek and Roman, is you've got this sense of historical times with certain key individuals like Moses or mm -hmm. Jesus or Mohammed. Abraham. Abraham mm -hmm. and all the others. Jacob and all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They become historical figures. Right. Where in Africa they would become ancestral figures or even maybe deities. Yes. Like Shango. Yeah. Um, so it, it still plays the role. It doesn't mean history has disappeared. It just means a different concept of history, a circular concept of history. And the Europeans don't believe in reincarnation. As you know, the Indians do. Yeah. The Africans have a sense of reincarnation in that it's not that your child will be your grandfather reborn, but certain features of your grandfather will be in the child. In the yeah. child. Yeah. So, so it's so a whole package of stuff came in with uh, colonial, uh, I don't know, ideology. You see, in a society that had a concept of historical time, moving forward, the chosen people, and then of course this got transmuted in the white version of Christianity mm. into racial supremacy. Mm. So how would you place, now that we're on the subject, how, how would you place the griots, African traditional griots, in this yeah, concept of what you're expressing? Very good. I mean, it's true, if you take the Jalis some of the songs they sing are 800 years old. So they did have a concept mm. of, I mean, where you can have long-term memory. One of the, in any uh, society that doesn't have a form of writing, the best way of memorizing anything is turn it into a poem, a rhyme, or a song. Okay. And it ho there's a part of the brain in which music is processed, which is very close to the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain. And so that anything that's turned into poetry or rhyme or dance um, has a very heavy emotional e overtone, which means it, 
It's like you can't remember the boring days of your past, your childhood, but a very interesting or horrible day, memorable, emotional day, you will remember. Yes. yes. So this has been a trick of the human race. The, um, for instance, the ancient Greeks, the goddess of memory was called Memesin. She's a goddess of memory, but her children, her daughters, was music, dance, drama, and so on, poetry. Right. So most societies have recognized that the only way you can keep your memory alive is by turning it into musical dance or poetry, um, if, if you don't have a writing system. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that there, in Africa, generally, there wasn't a griot, but one of the interesting things about griots and the jalis, or the lunsu up in Dagbon, mm -hmm. or the traditional Yoruba drummers in Lagos, is that it, they tend to, tend to be c connected with kingship systems. Okay. Now, kings do become very interested in geone genealogy. Kingship, you know, your line, are you yes. from... Um, but if you take most traditional African societies, they weren't based on... They weren't feudal societies with a king at the top who needed his griots to, get, to provide him with history. Mm. Most people didn't... Most people actually lived in decentralized village communities with maybe, at the maximum, a chief or a paramount chief, mm -hmm. maybe, a, so that um, most societies would not have king lists. They might have chief lists back to a certain point, then they would just become ancestralized. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, but you, you do get historical time coming into African societies where there were very structured kingship systems because they were centralized. Um, as I say, for 800 years in the case of the Mali and Griots. Yeah. Um, but it, that was all to do with the over... Th there were people before the kings of Mali. You know, the original kings of Mali were, in fact, blacksmiths. And there was this big battle between the uh, Sundeata, I think, Sundeata. Mm -hmm. And the f he had to overthrow the blacksmiths who had taken seized power because they could make weapons right. out of iron. Um, so sometimes these things become myths. Even in Greece and Rome, a lot of these right. stories were real stories, but mm. they became myths. But I'm just trying to f wonder why G Ghanaians, because you, you don't have many... Let me give you an example. In Britain, we have so many museums and libraries. Yes. But you know what they were? They were for the rich people who were looting the world. <laughs> <laughs> and looting their own people, yeah. building their places based on slavery, mm -hmm. and so on. So, and now they don't want to give the things back. Mm. Um, I won't go into that story, but the thing is that the, pa the European mental package with, it has very beneficial things for human race. Yes. Um, but it's gone over the top on individualism. Like right now, a young child born in Britain or America now has, is so individualistic, it has to choose its own sex. I mean, like we were talking about earlier. I mean, it's, it, everything has been individualized. Um, the, the capitalist system is based on private profit, profit and the individualistic ethos. And in, individuals co uh, uh, come in historical times. So it was a whole mindset that was created out of the Judaic religion. And this is why the Jews hated all the other religions, because the other religions were fertility religions, even the ancient Egyptians, which are based on cyclical, cyclical time. I mean, I'll just give you one story about the Egyptians. Okay, they, they believed in cir circular time, and they had okay. a lot of their gods uh, or great heroes and pharaohs were ancestralized, but they also did have a concept of cyclical time. The obvious one is every day, every week, every month, every year. And we have every four years for the leap year, right? Yeah. You know what the Egyptians did? And this is a so-called primitive society right. compared to, we think we're so advanced. Mm -hmm. they, what we do in the West is we count up the, f you know, every year is a quarter day more than 365 years mm -hmm. and a quarter. So we wait after four years, we add the, th the four quarters together to get a full day and that make that the leap year with the extra day in right. February. Mm. You know what the Egyptians did? They took all the quarter days and waited till it came to a full year. It takes 1,256, or you can calculate it yourself. It's, and they would have a celebration at the end of that cycle. They called it the Sophic year. Now, can you imagine a civilization that had politicians or leaders or rulers who were thinking in circular time, 
But the biggest circle was 1,260. Go to any politician in the West, go to any politician in Ghana or Nigeria and tell him, are you planning for the year 1,256? They'll say, no, we're thinking about the next four years. Yeah. You see? <laughs> so there are great advantages to circular time. And just to, the final stop on this conversation mm. is that the Europeans also fabricated a, me a mechanistic concept of the universe based on linear, linear time or graphical time. Mm. And they came up with the clockwork universe. Yes. Everything is mechanisms operating in what we call Cartesian or Newtonian time. And it's all mechanics. Right. Well, scientists don't believe in this anymore. They believe in circular time. Einstein proved that. that the, the universe is, is folded up in itself. Everything moves in circles. So in fact, the African concept of time in music, in cyclical time history, is actually a very advanced concept because it fits in tune now with the modern society in the modern age of science. And the European concept of time and their music, which is very linear, you read it from beginning to end, um, or very hierarchically organized, their concept of time reflects an older concept of the universe, which is the mechanistic universe, which came out of the Judeo-Christian religion and it came out of science and so on. And it's very good for making weapons of mass destruction. Mm. Yeah, very handy for that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> advanced rockets and things. Yeah. But the African sense of time was circular, but it doesn't mean small circles. We live for 70 years. We can go back 150 years with our grandparents, maybe. We can go back a few more hundred years with some founding kings or ancestors. But the ancient Egyptians were going, they were circling their civilization. And when the ancient Greeks conquered e Egypt, I think it was, um, was it uh, 300 BC or whenever, Alexander the Great, one of the things that they really got pissed off with is that here we are, the Greeks, we've conquered now Egyptian civilization. We set up a Ptolemaic pharaoh and all this business. But it disturbed the Greeks to be in a civilization which had already gone into its third or fourth Sophic cycle. Because it goes back to about four or 5,000 BC. So right. you have a civilization that's so old, it can have a ceremony going on uh, where everybody had a holiday for one year. Uh, for for one year? One year, one year holiday. What, not one day, leap year. Mm, 29th yeah. of February, no, a whole mm, mm. full year of celebration. So they were planning for it, getting the harvest in, putting, you know, for a big party and making plenty of bread and beer. Um, but imagine you're the people who conquered these people. Yes. And you have maybe a history going back five or a hundred years or something, you know, whatever. And then you come and meet a civilization. So you, guess what the Greeks did? They destroyed the cult. They couldn't stand it. The, the, this society was so ancient that they, they were conceiving of time in terms of a thousand years. And look where we are now. We're now worse than the Greeks. Ancient Greeks, at least they would look back a few hundred years or something. Mm. Where do we look? Or into the future, which yeah. is more important. Four years. Yes. Democracy means you can only look four years into the future. That's why China has made the great leaps and bounds. Because they weren't curtailed by democracy. Absolutely. I mean... Go ahead. No, no. no. So, I, I, there's such a wealth of knowledge... I'm sure we could talk to you for five years because I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to absorbing this kind of information. But just to kind of finish that point on documentation, I think the so the little bit of history that I've read, even with my I'm, so I'm part Ga, I'm part Ethiopian. Okay. But if you look at Ghanaian ethnic groups, we all had ways of recording things. So, for instance, you say your last name, he says his last name, you can go point to what house he comes from, in what yeah. community. And so, there, there's an existing desire to document and to record, but the only formats that we were probably not using as efficiently is the written version of it. Yeah. And I'm, 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 I'm striving to understand why the disconnect that if we always had a sense to record and document or be able to look at things in that context of where did it come from and who is included in it, then why didn't we naturally evolve 
or gravitate towards the concept of putting it in the format that is most universal now, which is the written mm. form. Okay, uh, well, one of, one of the th things is colonialism. I mean, at the beginning, Ghanaians were forced to accept a foreign culture through the gun and the Bible and all this type of thing. Um, but once the Ghanaians had mastered reading, I mean, the Bible itself, to become a Christian, you have to be able to read and write. Yes. You see? I mean, don't forget what happened to the, the slaves in America. They became Christians despite the white Christians because the white Christians wouldn't teach the slaves Christianity because it meant you had to be able to read and write, which means you became a threat. Yes. So basically, the, the colonialism brought in its own undoing, literacy. And at first, it was brainwashing into, I'm sure, well, you probably are too young, but when I was first in Ghana, Ghanaians were still being taught about the histories of English kings, mm -hmm. this type of nonsense, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it takes any, any, in a learning process, even a learning under the, under the uh, obligation of colonialism, is first of all, you copy or Im imitate, you take the things you need, and one of them obviously is writing and reading, it's a very useful device, mm -hmm. um, and then you apply it to your own society, but there's a time lag in it. And I think it's, there were some few African scholars coming up with independence, but now I think what's beginning to happen is that there are more young people who have got, I mean, they were brought up as literate people in schools. So now it's very familiar to them so they can apply it. So I think the thing is going to happen, mm. but there was a t it's like any, any situation where a new thing is introduced. You, if you're overwhelmed by it, whether it's James Brown or hip hop from America, you copy it first. Mm -hmm. you, for a number of years, you copycat. Then you use what you need to find your own voice and you move on. Right. And I think that's, and maybe societies take a bit longer to change than song genres. You know, the genre maybe music can happen every 20 years or 10 years, but societies take longer. So I think the, there are now, I mean, what I've noticed from my own uh, museum is when I first set up my High Life Museum in 1990, it was mainly foreigners who were coming, or media people from Ghana who wanted, you know, to pick my brains about E.T. Mensa or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I'm getting more people like yourselves, podcasters, young people, because everybody wants to reconnect. Yes. And if you want to reconnect, there's a very good trick in reconnecting with the past. You don't re re reconnect with your parents because maybe you had a fight with them. Who knows? Yes. You reconnect with your grandparents. Mm -hmm. If you lose your grandparents, you're, if you don't get their material, you're lost. 100% yeah? true. And I know this because what happened in the Vietnam War, um, the, there was a terrible war in Vietnam for 20 years um, in which the French and the Americans invaded the country, right. killed about a million people. And there was a disconnection between the grandparents who couldn't go to war and the children who had been born. And the children, the only thing they could do when they cleared the Americans out, I met some Vietnamese people and they told me the whole story, is that there was a disconnect in culture between the children and the, the grandparents, because the whole of the adult population had been involved in the war. So they, they're making a big effort to get the grandchildren in touch with the gr grandparents. And I think that's what's going on right now in Ghana, because we did have a generation in Ghana that rejected old things. Mm -hmm. I call it the hip life generation, or Generation X. I don't mean the hip life we have today, yeah, but the yeah. original hip life, it, it was very antagonistic when it first came to anything traditional. Yes. Okay. Now, which means that a young person who's born to a hip life, because now, you know, Reggie Roxton is a grandfather himself. Yes. You know, and I'm not talking about Reggie Roxton himself. Yes. He was an advanced personality uh, brain, but there were some hip lifers. They used to come to my studio. Um, I got to use drum machine and all these type, and I, they don't want any traditional music on, and drums or anything like this and th whatever it was, anything that would get up the nose of their parents. Because um, it's like pushing the parents away. Yes. So what you can do is you can jump to, to the grandparents. And this is a natural phenomenon. It's been going on for millions of years, ever since the human race evolved. The grandparents have been the repository. Um, maybe, so when you, as a child, you're learning something from your parents, but sometimes you fight your parents and you mm -hmm. go the opposite direction. 
then the grandparents can come in. So I think a lot of that's now happening with the modern generation, the youth. But now they're not only literate with writing, they're literate with computers, thanks to hip life. You see, the hip life, I don't like it much because it threw old things away, but it got the Ghanaian youth familiar with modern technology. Mm -hmm. So the young ch technology, yourselves, my son, they know a million times more than I do about technology. So now you've got all the, all the gadgets and all the ways of... But then you have to make sure you can... Who are you going to get the information from? Because a lot of the information in Ghana wasn't written down. Mm -hmm. So the only hope now is to go to the older generation. Mm. That's yeah, and that's what we are doing now. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, wow, a whole lot of on, on, on you know, his history. Yes. And documenting. Yeah. <laughs> one, one hour. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, how... Uh, did you play for the Jaguar Jokers? Yeah, I played guitar. How, how was touring with, with them like? Well, when I, got, when I came to Ghana to stay with my father, I was going to start at Lagon, and it was during the summer holidays. Mm. So, so I had, and then my father had married a Ghanaian lady called my Auntie Ama Adua, who was actually, I think, a, a chim from living in Adwajiri, and he built a house for her. So I went to meet my stepmother. Mm -hmm. This is 1969. And I hadn't started at Legon by then, because the classes hadn't started. And then I was carrying a guitar, and one of her tenants was Opia, the leader of the Jaguar Opia? Jokers. Yeah, Opia. Oh, wow. So he, said, uh, he beggared my friend, and he took me on the road, and that's how it started, mm. even before I started at Legon. Oh, wow. Um, so it was serendipity, and I, could, I was playing rock music, a little bit of jazz, but they were interested in rock. So I'd, they would use me as a gimmick. They would take me around the villages, white man playing guitar. Yeah. I couldn't play high life at the time. Yeah, I yeah. Learning. I was actually gonna gonna ask, how was the transition like? Like you playing rock and now? It took me about high. two years. And my problem was, when I was very young, they used to call me Johnny Walker, giddy giddy. <laughs> um, my problem with high life is, uh, I couldn't slow myself down. I'm not saying mm. you, high life is slow. But mm. I didn't realize that there are spaces within sounds. Mm. You, I always thought you have a sound, a music or whatever it is, yeah. or a drumming beat, and it's boop, 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 boop. You just hear the boop, mm. boop. You don't hear the in-betweens, yeah, yeah. the silences or yeah. the gaps. So I, the first thing I had to do is I had to slow myself. And that's why I called my first band Boko. Boko, Leo, okay. yeah. Oh, Boko band? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, wow. Oh, Fred, did you know that book of one? I've seen it, but yeah. I, I haven't... Oh, wow. Yeah. That's true. Oh, wow. So, um, are there any similarities between the rock that you were playing and, you know, high life? I, I know you said you have, you have to struggle to, you know, slow down and all that, but are there any, you know, similarities? There, well, there are some, but the dissimilarities dis dis are bigger. Um, one of them was, you see, I was in a rock band. And in a rock band, I was a rhythm guitarist. You have a hierarchical organization. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a symphonic orchestra, yeah. you know, conductor, first virtuoso. So we had the superstar, the singer, then the first guitar, rhythm guitar, and so on. So we, everything was hierarchical. Yeah. When I came to the guitar bands, I discovered, I, I remember asking them, who's the lead guitarist? Ah, huh? lead? We don't have any, what do you mean lead guitarist? <laughs> You see, what the guitar bands had done in those days is they took the philosophy from drumming, African drumming, where you don't mm -hmm. have a lead drummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The master drummer is not the yeah, lead drummer. Yeah. All the beats, even the small boy playing yeah, the cowbell yeah, are equal. Yeah. So what they did is they took that philosophy. I don't mean consciously, but they worked it into their guitars. So you have about three or four guitars, each playing polyphonically against each other. So you could, I met, what I met was the most democratic music I'd ever met in my mm. life. Because all the beats, all the voices are equal in traditional African music. And this was transmitted into the guitar band music. So I didn't have to be a lead guitarist. I could be a tenor guitar. You can call it what you want. Yeah. They have different names. Um, so, th so, so there were some fundamental differences in the music. Mm. Of course, certain things were the same, like um, the use of the blues note. The, th the flat and seventh is used in rock and roll yeah. because rock and roll is based on rhythm and blues, which is based on the blues. And they used a flattened note, yeah. which is used in traditional 
African music, like Shanti music. Mm. Um, so there were some similarities, and it was a dance music, but um, th th there were some very big musical differences as well. Mm. And I liked being in a, a high life band because, number one, it's da dance music. I believe that my music, and, if you s separate music and dance in your music in a society, you basically killed your music. I'll give you the proof of this, what yeah. I'm saying. The Europeans, twice over, have created major forms of music in which they deny dance. One is Catholic, the Catholics and the Christians in Britain, not in America mm -hmm. or in Ghana, but in, in, in Europe, they don't allow dancing in the churches as a form of worship, worshiping God. You know, you do, 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 it's not like in Ghana. True. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes back that dancing is a sin. Mm -hmm. And then they invented art Asaboni. music. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. Then they invented the art music, yeah. no dancing. So what they've gone and done is created two major forms of music which have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, which doesn't allow dance. Mm. Once you disconnect music from the body, the physical body, dancing, that music will wither away in the end, or will become tr transmuted into dance music, which has happened in Africa with the Christian churches, or the black Americans. Wow. They're all dancing churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, it w and that's why... Western art music, classical art music, is no longer the dominant form of music on the planet. They took two things out of music, which is the kiss of death. One is dancing, the other is improvisation. And you, cry, you create a, pro a producer music based on those, or without those two principles. The music can exist for a hundred years maybe, a few hundred years, but in the end, it will never be the dominant music of the planet. The dominant music of the planet right now is, first of all, Black American and Caribbean music, followed by African music. Why yeah. isn't white music the dominant musical force in the planet? It's been hijacked mm. by every society and turned into something else. So in Ghana, the Christians turned uh, Christian music, mm. Western Christian music, into gospel music, yeah. in, uh, into dance music. Yeah. You dance now. Because yeah. you're, so, uh, I mean, I'm always interested in any music that includes dance yeah do you, do, you, do you think that that's why afro beat is now you know huge now one of the reasons yes i mean before afro beat you see when i when i first went to britain from ghana yeah you fallen in love with high life music afro beat you know i'd moved with fella and all these people um when i used to go to uh record shops in england and there were only a few record shops that dealt with african music like one or two in the whole of london Nobody was interested in African music, um, pop popular music in the 70s. Yeah. Nobody. Um, if I said high life or Afrobeat or Quayla music from South Africa, they don't, you know, because I'm talking about the youth. Yeah. They had their rock music and so on. Then, for the first time that African popular music started to penetrate was what we called world music mm -hmm. in the 80s. And I was sort of involved with that because I was living here and going backwards yeah. and forwards. And that, I would say that it didn't become a major form of music in the West, but it became about 3%, mm. which is the same as jazz. Yeah, so yeah. Africa, so Yusundu and all these guys were going. So the connection was made. Yeah. But what's happened with Afrobeats, it's, it's on a vaster scale. The penetration of African pop music into Europe or America now is, is, is becoming the dominant force, mm. or a dominant force. Yeah. So it goes from zero, when I was young, to 3%, yeah. in the 1980s to now, let's say, 50% or whatever with Burner Boy and Co. And the interesting thing about it is it's electronic dance music. Yeah. Always the body will come and save the soul, as well as the souls. See, the Westerners have an idea of religion that your soul is better than your body. Your body is always pulling you down into bad things. Yeah. But it's not so. We were created with both a soul and a body. Your soul can't exist without your body, yeah. your body without your soul. Um, so when you try to disconnect the soul and the body in music mm. and, make, and take out improvisation, make the music too intellectual, too written down on yeah. paper, yeah. you, it, you kill, kill off the thing. So, but then something else is happening with Afrobeats, which is really important. It's to do with Fela. The re retroactive claiming of Fela's legacy by the Afrobeats youth. Now, when Afrobeat started in 2010, 
I was in Nigeria in 2013. I, I, I gave a speech at one of the um, celebrations. And during that time, there was a huge controversy between the older generation of musicians, my generation, mm -hmm. who were all fanatical fella people, yeah. and the youth coming up with their Afrobeats. And they had a meeting at Victoria Island, uh, and they asked me to arbitrate because I was a foreigner, I was from Ghana, and so on. And so the older people were t insulting the younger ones. Oh, why are you using fella's name for your music? We don't know now what type of music yeah. is which. And then the youth were saying, um, oh, but we're also giving a type of respect to fella. But yeah. they were only saying that as a defense. Mm. So I got up and s they thought, because I'm older, I will bound to s support the older people. But I supported the youth on this. I said, every generation has a, a right to recycle culture and use any word it need, wants to. But then look what's happened. Mm. That prediction or defense saying, oh, that we're honoring fella has come back yep. because everything now to do with Afrobeats, yeah. fella is absorbed into it. So as Afrobeats has moved from Africa to Europe as a or America as a dance music, maybe the lyrics are not heavy compared to fella. But yeah. they're somehow carrying fella. So I imagine it like a ship. The mm. ship, there's a wind blowing in the direction of Africa or from Africa yeah. to America. Afrobeats, electronic dance music. Yeah. But a wind, a ship without a keel can be blown anywhere. Yeah. But if you have a keel, and the keel is fella. And just to prove the point, you know I was involved in this film with fella. Uh, in 1977, I acted in his film. Oh, really? Yeah, and the film was burnt. So I never became a film star. <laughs> but, but the thing is that some of the, um, the, the rushes... Would you, would you want? In a second. Uh, let me just finish this point, because okay. this is really interesting, because mm -hmm. I'm telling you hot news, which I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell you. I've been told not to tell anybody, but I, I'm telling you. It's to do with Feller's film. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, it's this... The, the soundtrack was destroyed. Some of it was redubbed. We'd redubbed it at Ghana Films, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but the, a lot of, some, of the, some of the actual film footage has been found now. Oh. So I put a French producer, filmmaker, in touch with Yeni Kuti and the family, and the, the children of Faisal Helwani and two other people who were all part of the original Black President film. They were the sta stakeholders. Um, and the plan was that the film would finally come out, not quite the way Fella imagined it, but maybe in some form. Yeah. What's happened is kind of <coughs> something quite different. They've decided to make a film about a young Afrobeats musician in Lagos, somebody like Wizkid or somebody, you know, yeah. equivalent, who's a bit militant and confrontational with the police and what the goings on. And what they're going to work the Fella's original film into it as flashbacks. So they've actually joined Fella directly with Afrobeats. I mean, this is just an example of this process. Wow. You see, your words are powerful. Very, very, very If you powerful, use the word yeah. Afrobeats, you are going to be bitten in your bottom by fella mm. in the end, whether you like it or not. Mm. And you see, when the youth were inventing Afrobeats, their position was, we are doing this against the older people. Yeah. But gradually, as you mature, and now Afrobeats is so many years old, 10 or whatever, then you sort of also start looking back into, it's like hip life. Look how hip yep. life started. Yep. They hated anything old, and in the end, we got Jammer Hip Life, which is reintegration of old beats. Yeah. So it takes time. These pro yeah. So the same thing has happened with Afro beats, but yeah. they've also included Fella. Now, it means this. James Brown was funk music, heaviest dance grooves in the world, as we know, yeah. but it came part and parcel of the civil rights movement, Afrocentrism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we took Bob Marley, fantastic you know, offbeats and skanking and everything. But the music got boosted by Rastafarianism, you know, the idea about Babylon and yeah. a, a philosophy mm -hmm. that appeals to the poor of the world. Well, Afrobeats without Fella would have just been something here today, gone tomorrow. Mm. But it's carrying a message now. So, so that just like James Brown, soul, Fella, I mean, uh, reggae music, yeah. Afrobeats has now got a... It doesn't mean you always have to sing about fella and serious. You can still dance and groove, but it's got that built yeah, into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually right now, Afrobeats is unstoppable because it's unstoppable musically and it's unstoppable because it's giving a voice to the oppressed. 
the, the Sufferheads. Fella called the oppressed people of the world the Sufferheads. Yeah. That was his name for yeah. them. Mm. Yeah. And that, that's going to make a big difference because the Americans, the, 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 the sort of Hollywood entertainment, would tell, oh, this is, we'll see what we can exploit from the Africans. They've got some good ideas about electronic dance music. We'll grab this and do this. But they don't know that this thing is coming in with Fella now. Prof, so um, Afrobeat, like talking about you know, the, the genres, um, Afrobeat, hip life, and high, high life. Why didn't, see, why, why didn't we see like hip life or high, high, high life cross o over like, you know, the way Afrobeat beat, beat us now? Okay. Um, one of the reasons is the critical role of black American and Caribbean music. Um, you know, high life, all of these beats in Africa African popular music have all been influ influenced by black American music, yeah. black Caribbean music. Actually, for 400, no, for 200 years, actually, there's been a crisscrossing mm. music. And, of course, the music coming from Africa in the first place. Yeah. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is about slavery. Any society that sets up an institution called slavery is putting a ticking time bomb inside itself. Um, Let's give, let me give you an example. The Romans uh, smashed uh, the Jewish state, right, 2,000 years ago, and enslaved the, the Jews who became Christians. And look what happened. Who took over the Ro Rome in the end? The Christians. 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 Yeah, Christians. The same thing has happened with black music. You bring slaves and... Um, say three four hundred years of course it's not religion it's, it's slightly different but it's still the same process yeah. and one of the great jobs of the whites was to prevent the con contamination of their own culture with the culture of the blacks mm. you know there was a race record thing you know there's a musical apartheid system in the yeah. united states yeah. and, all, and so on so what happens is you you put a ticking time bomb and it won't be you or maybe your children who were taken up by the the religion or the music of the slaves, mm. it will be somewhere down the line, it will happen. Yeah. It's guaranteed. And we've got two living proofs of it. What's happened in Israel yeah. and Rome and yeah. what happened in America with jazz mm. or reggae and so on. So the first thing to say is that the first step of the recognition of African music today is the recognition of black American music because that was actually in the heart of Babylon, the slaves. They had to be the first cosmopolitans. Mm -hmm. they, uh, in fact, this is what Africa's bringing to the world, cosmopolitan. It's not just Africanists or Africanisms. It, it's the po cosmopolitanism of Africans because they were forced to absorb another culture. Yeah, but yeah. if you talk to most English people, they can only, only know about England or Americans about America. Mm -hmm. As an African, you, you have all these different languages and you have Ameri British, French. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, the, so... We didn't, the first hints that we got that popular music, not from America or Caribbean, was going to hit the jackpot. So we, we can al already say that by the 1950s and 60s and 70s, the dominant world forms of music were already black music, but not from Africa. Yeah. Bob Marley yeah. and so on, yeah. or, you know, Zouk music or whatever. Yeah. Um, then, um, or Cuban music, Afro-Cuban. Yeah. Sometimes people would change the words, so they, they would call it, I, I don't know, they call it Afro-Cuban music now, they, salsa, but, you know. But, but what, what happens is that the music coming, the, the, the popular music coming out of Africa is African, it's got all the Western, uh, I don't know, instruments, scales, yeah, and it's got the black American thing inside, or black Caribbean. Yeah. Um, now the question is, if, which is more truly cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. actually. It's a world music. Yeah. Um, but why didn't it happen before? <coughs> because what we're going through right now with Afrobeats, and even beginning with world music, yeah. is the beginning of the domination of African black music, not just black American and Caribbean. But then black American and Caribbean music is already inside African music, both ways, as both origin Coming, music coming from Africa to the Americas, and then the music coming backwards, you know, through, I don't know, Louis Armstrong and all the others. Um, it, it, now, the, the, the change seems, 
The other change is the independence of Africa. None of what we're do talking about now could have happened without independence in Africa. There's no way, way the white colonialists would have allowed um, the, the colonized music of the you know, colonial people to come and dominate their own youth. Yes. It happened in America, though. Look at rock and roll. That was rhythm and blues. Yeah. Um, so they couldn't stop it in the end. So, but the thing is, it didn't happen with high life. Why didn't it happen with hip life? Because it takes time, you know, for thing process to occur. So you have independence in the si 60s. So by, the, by that time, you do get a few hints. Miriam Makiba, Osibisa. Osibisa, yeah. Um, uh, this guy, even not Fela, but so much, but this guy, Manu Dabango. You do get these few little examples mm -hmm. of African popular music crossing over. But it, it didn't really start until world music in the 80s. Um, so that would be a pr product of it, so that you could say that Africa now and the West are equal, at least politically independent. Um, it didn't happen with hip life because I think at the beginning, hip life was too primitive in its use of technology. They weren't able to handle the technology, so they were using very simple drum. It's like Burger High Life. You're just using simple drum beats from a, mm -hmm. a machine that's not even programmed to do African rhythms anyway, <coughs> or synthesizers and so on. So there was a. But, yeah. but why it's happening now is the African, because of hip life and because of um, techno pop, mm. the African musicians are now completely familiar with Western advanced technology. Yeah. So it's at the same technical standard as mm. anything in the West. But it's got the added ingredient of being, having an African element, obviously, yeah. having the European through the colonial contact, and having the black American. Mm. Through, so, and there's one other thing too. If we're in the age of electronic dance music, it's, maybe some people will say I'm wrong to say this, but it, let's take dance in America. Not African, well, Af uh, let's say white dances. Well, mm -hmm. hardly white dances. There are hardly any. Yeah, yeah, I, you know? I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Let's take African America, funk. Okay, funk co conquered America yeah. in the 60s. And yeah. actually, f funk was the original type of hi hip life. Yeah, hip life. You yeah. know, yeah. electro hip hop. Yeah. Um, very powerful rhythms. Uh, but they're, they're not inexhaustible. So the Europeans have been borrowing black rhythms for maybe 100, year, 100 years. But they're not inexhaustible. The rhythms in Africa are inexhaustible. I'll tell you why. Um, I did a survey of how many different drum dances do we have in Ghana from all the regions, the, 30, the 32 ethnic groups. And mine is just really, it's not complete, but I did try to make some lists amongst the Eves, the Akans, the Nzimas, the Fantis, the Gars, the Northerners, the Dagom people, I mean the whole works. And I got to about 500. It's incomplete. So I just made a calculation that if you take the population of Ghana compared to the whole population of black Africa, how many rhythms do we have in Africa? We've got 2,000 languages in Africa. You know there are only 7,000 languages in the whole planet. 2,000 of the languages in the world are in Africa alone. Mm -hmm. Each language is an ethnic group or a nation. Let's call them nations. Yeah. Then. Mm -hmm. um, and each nation has its own maybe 20, 30, 40. We don't know. Look at the, how, how rich the Eve or the Akan, uh, countless rhythms. Yeah. So I calculated we've got between about 12 and 15,000 rhythms in Africa. That's why I said it's inexhaustible. So if the, the West wow. now has gone and produced, has got, become so fascinated by dance and they want an inexhaustible supply of rhythms, yeah. that's where, that, this is the place to be. I mean, it, it's only that those rhythms need to be brought by Africans and processed by Africans and not as raw material yeah. for some c companies in Britain yeah. to, or America to take the African rhythms and refine them and then yeah. copyright them and so on. Yeah. So I think the reason, uh, that's why Afro, Afrobeats is the first generation of, let's, I don't know so much about pi uh, 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 what, that piano thing in Ama, Ama Piano, piano. Um, uh, but uh, at least in West Africa, a youth musicians who have been totally conversant with modern music technology, whereas the hip lifers were just beginning, mm. using, you know, yeah. and the burger high life and that disco 
era, they were beginning to use technology, but when you took their music to the West, it didn't sound up to the standard. Yeah. Now, there's complete equality. Yeah. But of course, uh, the, the, it, so there are a whole number of reasons why hip, 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 not hip hop so much, but now th through Afrobeats, which when, when, when all is said and done, Afrobeats now has hip hop, high life, raga, yeah, all sorts yeah. of things. It's, in, the, it's the most, yeah. yes, it's cosmopolitan, yeah. number one. We're living in a global world. It's, it's a dance music that Europeans have tried twice over to produce major forms of music which exclude dance. Yeah. And they haven't succeeded. Either the music has died off or it's been transmuted into dance music in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Now the Christians, you know, I mean, there were some Af Af African churches that still refused to dance. You know, like the, mm. there was mm. one church in the Volta region that older people refused to allow people to dance to Jesus. Yeah. They don't, the, the congregation just disappears. Yeah. Because people mm -hmm. want to dance. Yeah. Je Jesus and the prophets danced. Yeah, they did. Um, but don't you, did, did tech play a role with the rise of Afrobeats? Because Afrobeats, like 20, 2010, that was when, you know, social media was becoming big and huge, the Twitters, you know, and all that. Do you think tech also played play a, ro a role? Yeah, the demo democratization of music production and dissemination oh, yeah. and FM radio and all this type yeah. of thing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is now everybody's in touch with everybody. It's, yeah. ju it's just that the world's resources are held in a few people's hands. Mm. But e a lot of, in the, the global village or whatever you want to call yeah. it, yeah, I mean, obviously it's it's technological, um, but you have to have the right music at the right time, mm. and yeah. and this is a product, when all is said and done, of a fusion of Western music, ex-slave music, and ex-colonized people mm. music. It's exactly like what happened to Christianity in Rome. Yeah, it's taken over the world. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and it couldn't have happened unless Africa had become independent. It, it, and it, it couldn't have happened unless white youth at some points in history in America took up black American music. Yes, much yeah. against the wishes of the elders, you know, with jazz, rock and roll, and all this type yeah. of thing. So it, it, it's, it's the area of real e yeah. equalization now yeah. um, of, the, of the two sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, so I personally, I mean, being an older generation, I don't like Afrobeats very much, um, with an S, you know, not mm. fellow music, but yeah. um, it's an age problem. But what I've recognized is that, then I tell my students this, because some of my students also say, well, they don't really like Afrobeats, it's not this, it's not that. I, I said, it doesn't matter, it's a battering ram. Yep. You know, it's mm. going to, it's smashing open, not just a trickle, but full flood of African yeah. popular music. And all sorts of African music will follow in its wake. Mm. Once you open the door, other forms will come. Yeah. You know, maybe art music, maybe traditional music, and uh, new ones that are being cooked up by yeah. somebody right now. Yeah. We don't know. But you have to open the door, like world, the, what they called world music back in the 80s. It was like a door had been opened. Yeah. I think the, the bands that really opened up world music let me tell you this story because I was actually involved and it's to do with Bob Marley. Island Records. Yeah. Okay, Bob Marley became sick around about, what, 1978 or 79. You remember he started to become yeah, sick yeah, and yeah. he mm -hmm. died. Right, yeah. So Island Records, which is an independent label, was his label. I met them in London in 1979 with a guy called Charles Eastman, who was a very good friend of mine, Ghanaian. Um, we're two experts on African music, so yeah. we we're brought to them to have tea and donuts or something. And what they were, they were saying, they wanted now to explore African music. And I realized later what was going on. They knew that Bob Marley was sick. And they were looking for another black star, but not this time from the Caribbean. They wanted to delve into African Africa. music. And mm. so the, all the questions to me and Charles was what, type of African music do you think we should move into, which would be very good? And we gave them some ideas, you know, high life juju music and um, uh, sucrus and so mm. on, which we were, and, and fella's music, of yeah. course. But at that time, nobody wanted to touch fella because um, he was too difficult yeah, to handle. Yeah, yeah, he, will go into, he will go into his, your studio or your house and 
tell his people to throw shit on the wall or something. I mean, he was <laughs> completely crazy. So no, that's why he became famous after he died yeah, internationally, because yeah. nobody would touch him. Even Nigerians wouldn't touch him. Yeah. Uh, Chief Abiola tried. Yeah. Um, anyway, what, what was I saying about uh, yeah, this yeah. F- f- mysterious meeting? And lo and behold, about two years later, yeah. the first breakthrough into what we call world music was Sonny Ade. But he wasn't playing typical juju music. Mm-hmm. He was playing synchro system. It was a, <coughs> he had a big hit with that. Yeah. And do you know what it was? He brought in one of Fella's guitarists to put in an Afrobeat groove. So, because the Europeans or Americans wouldn't have been familiar with juju music, but once they heard the funk groove, yeah. that fell away, you know, that's, and that was, hit the, was the first to hit the jackpot. And then there were some other bands. Um, so it, it, once you open the door to, say, commercial success yeah. of African music, maybe it's one, it wasn't Fella's music, but Fella was inside that music yeah. because of the guitarist. Yeah. So it, mm. I could, if I had my, I could, if you listen to some of the synchro system, you will even say it's a type of Yoruba Afrobeat. Mm. It was just an experimental thing that Sonny Ade was doing at that time. And it, was, it hit the jackpot for the moment. And then other types of music, sukus and so on, came yeah. in. Um, but now I, mean, think, I think what's going on is, it, that was 3%. I, did, I was working, actually, believe it or not, I was, actually went to the World, the World Bank called me at one point. And they were interested in uh, trying to boost the African music industry because they recognized there's commercial this mm-hmm. was because of the world yeah. music thing, and I, I was brought there. Um, and we, I had to make all the, I had to crack my brains and give them reasons and so on. And one was that, you know, world music had established itself as about 3% of the global market in music, which doesn't sound much, mm. but it's actually quite substantial. Mm. Enough for the World Bank to, to yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but what we're seeing something now, I think, is, is much bigger. Yeah. But again, fella is inside. And thank God for that. Yeah. Because without fella inside, if this was just tinsel music from Africa for people to just purely dance, yeah. there's no harm in people dancing. It's, dancing is therapeutic in its own right. But it can often the, the song might be just about having a good time, party yeah. time, let's go and groove and this. But once you link fella in with it, I think it's going to be unstoppable. Yeah. It's going to be like Bob Marley yeah. or James yeah. Brown. It's unstoppable. Yeah. Mm. No. Before I go go back to, to, to my main question, there, there's a question that I want to ask. Um, one one person that people don't mention, like people don't mention his name enough, um, or, or Chachima Asante. Oh, yeah. did, did you did you ever meet meet him? I, I not only met him, he recorded in my studio. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I know him very like, well. Like people don't speak about him a whole lot, but he's one of my you know faves. Like I really really. Like or or Chachima as 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 Asante, you know. Yeah, I met him through Faisal Helwani, oh. and he was working with one of Faisal's bands, um, Hejole. Yeah, Hejole. And then he yeah. went to America with mm. Hugh Masakila. Yeah. Then and later on, he used to visit me. He had a, f- a friend called Plunky, who mm. was a Black American sax player, and they made various trips to Ghana. Uh, and then I met him. Then he came to my studio, um, and he recorded a band. He played on one of the band uh, one, with one of the bands, and I got to know him again. I keep on bumping into mm. him, and yes, I, I agree with you. He's a bit like Guy Warren. Coffee. Yeah, 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 yeah mm. exa- exactly, mm. Ex- exactly, exactly, mm. exactly. So, um, in the seventies, the eighties, the and even the sixties, if I'm if I'm if I'm if I'm not wrong, um, high life music was big. There were bandstands, you know, clubs yeah, that yeah. were playing, you know. You know, highlight like that. My mom and my grandma told me about you know some of those nights and and, and and all that, and the coup came and you know things stalled you know a, a little bit, and I still think that that genre isn't back in in its full flesh yet. Do you think there will be a time, or do you agree agree agree, agree with me, or do you think there will be a time where it will become big again. It may be, but it may not be in Ghana. It may be in Nigeria. It may mm. not. You know, when I was first in Ghana, Ghana was the mecca for music, for yep. everybody. Not just the first to gain independence, but yeah. in terms of the creation of high life, went to Nigeria. 
I met so many Nigerian musicians, not just in Nigeria, but coming to Come Ghana. Um, you know, the, the, it, how can I put it? Um, sometimes you will reap, but you won't sow. So, mm. you know, the seeds that Ghana sowed in terms of high life, let's say, if you take high life, for instance, right now, yeah. we have probably still in Ghana maybe three or four major types of high life. You know, you have the church high life, gospel, the brass band, brass band palm wine or guitar yeah. band, dance band, and so on. Maybe burger high life and yes. a few others. But you go to Nigeria, you know how many types of high life there are? Yeah. Well, min minimum of seven, <coughs> 17. Wow. Mm? Because it's been indigenized into villages and provincial yeah. areas. Um, it, in a way, high life was never purely Ghanaian. It's a pan-West Af pan African. You know, there were Liberian mm. guitar techniques, Sierra Leone, Ashiko. Ghana, but it, it crystallized in Ghana. Um, oh. And sometimes, it's a bit like, again, like the Bible. Uh, it's like John the Baptist and Jesus. Sometimes something has to come first to lead to something yeah, else. Yeah. And you, mm. that's what I mean. Sometimes you sow the seeds, but you don't reap. That's life. Yeah. Um, because it seems that Afrobeats has really become centered in Nigeria. Doesn't mean that Ghana can't be involved. Mm. In fact, Ghana had the first Afrobeats, but they called it Azonto. Azonto oh. was, Af was Afrobeats. Oh, it wow. was. Yes, you know when it first started in, uh, in Ghana, it was started about two or three years before Afrobeats. Afrobeats yeah. And yeah. Um, the Azonto... Um, was the sort of dance for the hip life. You know, hip life came with no dance. Yeah. And it was only with Azonto that we got a dance for hip life. And then there was this DJ in London called uh, DJ Abrantier. Abrantier, yeah. Charles. Yeah. Yes. And he was the one who coined the name Afrobeats for Azonto and the different types of Niger mm. raps and so on. Because yeah. um, he had a program called Afrobeats. Afrobeats, yeah. yeah. And later on, he regretted using that word because of the confusion, which is why I was asked to arbitrate it at Nigerian meeting. But in fact, in the long run, it's good. Mm. That mistake or coincidence yeah. has gone in favor of Afrobeats yeah. because it's, now you cannot take fella out of it. Out of it, true. Mm? And that's critical because you've got to have music with a message. If you have mu music that's just, you're just dancing only, it'll be like disco music. And this yeah. disco never gave any type of, what, what would I call it, um, direction, prophecy, or, or to the downtrodden people of the world. Yeah. It was a form of escapism, yeah. which is good. I mean, we need to escape from life sometimes. But, mm. but uh, and, uh, so Afrobeat could, beats could have easily become a, an escapist form of dancing, but it's got fella now tucked up inside it. With, and fella is the equivalent to me, to Mao Zedong, mm. a communist leader, yeah. or, or Gaddafi. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all the great leaders, who have got sort of visions for their people will write books. So mm -hmm. uh, Karl Marx wrote the Ma Com Communist Manifesto. Yes. Gaddafi had his green book. Yeah. Mao Zedong had his red book. Well, Nigeria has fellow songs. He, you know, he's, yeah. it's, it's politics yeah. or social politics or whatever you want to yeah. call it. So that now that that's embedded inside Afrobeats, it'll be like Bob Marley and Rastafarianism mm. or Afrocentrism and... Uh, uh, James, Brown. James Brown. So it's an unstoppable combination of the best mu dance music in the world, yeah. you know, and it's also got funk inside it. Yeah. So it's got Amer black American music inside it. Yeah. It's got all the tricks of the trade of European music in mm. it. And now the, the young generation in Ghana are completely computer literate. So what's stopping them? Yeah. Th there's yeah. nothing stopping them. That's why it's happening. Yeah. Pray. You want yeah, um, are we still on music? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, one of the things, we, we're talking about how hip, hip life didn't get on the world stage, uh, high life didn't get on the world stage. I'm wondering, I think you've touched a bit on it, but I'm wondering if some, some of it is also, I think, a, a phrase that you use, maturity of the music. He hadn't evolved quite yet to have like an appeal to the universal ear, where it felt more like high life was a closer to an indigenous sound than Afrobeats of today, where it's almost like an amalgamation of, like you're saying, it's global. 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 It's, yeah. it's got elements of reggae, dancehall, 
it's got hip hop in there, mm -hmm. all of that melting pot. And I've, I've, I am thinking, I don't know how to express it, so maybe you can put it into words. But I feel like the artist has also found the African expression of the music. Whereas, you know, when we're trying to do dancehall, an African trying to sound like a dancehall artist is not genuinely Jamaican, so you can tell. Yeah. yeah. And then the hip life was us trying to rap, which was more African American than not. And it feels like Afro beats is our thing. That's organically come from the streets of the evolution of all these genres. But when the artists are making their records, it sounds like them authentic. It's a very interesting thing you're saying because if you if you take high life, some of the origins of high life are American jazz. I mean. It doesn't mean it comes from up, but it's an influence. Yes. And uh, hip hop, hip life, obviously hip hop. Now, when you come to um, Afrobeats, there is no black American precursor as such. So you're right. Okay. I hadn't thought about it that, from that point of view, but you're actually right, because even with hip life, at least it had an American prototype, and then they were singing in Shui or Ga. Yes. And then later, retroactively, they brought in the Jammer beats. Yes. But you know, it was never... And then finally, they brought in the Azonto dance. Um, but uh, with Afro beats, it's true. What, what it, 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 I mean, you could call it electronic African music or something, but it doesn't have a direct pre precursor or input. Say, um, uh, Congolese music, you can say the rumba mm -hmm. or something like this. Um, Juju music in Nigeria, there was a samba influence coming in f from freed slaves. So a lot of African popular music forms have a sort of a, an important black American or black Caribbean element, which was critical for its development. But in the case of Afrobeats, it's true, you can't say that it came from R&B or dance hall. It's everything. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. everything and... and but. Yeah, I, I, that, that's a good point you made. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. An, a, an amalgamation. It's it's true. <laughs> it's truly, an, yeah. It's so African that you can't anyway say, well, that it, it was a copy of this. Yes. Yeah. It was yeah, never yeah. a copy of anything. Yeah. It was just yeah. itself from the beginning. Yeah. 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 So 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 now now let's come back to the present. Um, I, I am. I know you are in tune. You know, with the sound. You have always been in tune with the sound. And one thing that we usually ask our guests if we are talking about music is who is running things for them now. So currently, who is, you know, you know, who are, are you listening to, you know? I'm just, well, what, one group that I really, my son also, um, we really love them. They're called the Cavemen. Oh, shouts to the Cavemen, shouts to the Cavemen. Yeah. And... I, yeah, I mean they are they are they are good. Let me say what I I, I will say. I I know as Ghanaians you might feel a bit hurt by what I'm going to mm. say, but you know there are many attempts in Ghana to modernize high life, right? Mm. Um, let let's say uh, Kisabidi and all the, the mm. contemporary high life musicians. Yeah. But what they've tended to do is take something from high life, like a loop or a sound, and then mix it into their music. Yeah. But what the cavemen have done is gone to a higher level. Mm. They've taken the Nigerian form of Eastern Nigerian high life, Stephen Osadebe, that yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. And they don't just take a little element, they take the whole structure. The only thing I was talking about earlier, about the, the polyphonic relationship between yeah, the guitars. Yeah, yeah, between the, yeah, between the guitars, yeah. They brought it in, so, mm. and they're, they're, they're fully fluent with le uh, le technology, so that way it's covered. And they've actually taken the old style of Igbo high life guitar band, mm. not the dance band, but the guitar, yeah, guitar band, yeah. and they put it on into a, uh, into a new form. The and Cavemen is a Nigerian group? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. They've actually come to, to visit me at my house. Oh, wow. Both of them. Okay. They're, they're two brothers. Yeah. Oh. So I've been telling my students, listen to the Cavemen, because yeah. they're fully competent at the electronic side, yeah. and they do, they're just not taking... You see, you can make your sound... You can call it electronic high life. This brother, brother by Kisabidi, yeah, remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. It would take a little loop from somebody's guitar band. We still don't know today which, mm, which, which is, is it? but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't. It didn't take the whole 
thing that had been created by the guitar bands, yeah. uh, you know, which is the relationship between two different guitars playing counterpoint off, yeah, off each yeah, other. Yeah. Um, and they do. And I, I, I went and said that the most highly advanced form of contemporary high life now is them. Mm, that's, but mm, that's, that's, but they've been coming to Ghana, yeah, so it's yeah, you know yeah. people can mix yeah, up and yeah. get ideas from each other. That's 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 that took me by surprise, you know, because I recently you know discovered them. I think like four or five months ago. Okay. Yeah, and and I, and I was listening to them for like for like weeks. And oh, not wow. a, and not a, yeah. they're really articulate guys. When you talk, mm. they're very thoughtful people. Mm. I have, uh, the conversation I'm having with you now, yeah. I've had a little conversation, something like this, in my yeah. garden with them. Because oh, yeah. they've, they've really thought out about mm. what they're doing. Mm. They've taken, there's a guy called Stephen Osadebe, who, I, it would be equivalent to somebody like E.K. Nyami, mm. or somebody like this in Ghana, who major, and even they'd say that he was one of their inspirations, but mm. they didn't take just a little sound from his voice or his guitar playing. Yeah. They, they took this actual philosophical way that he, the guitar bands, just, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the guitar bands, which s sadly now are disappearing in Ghana, yeah, were the most African form of high life compared to the dance bands. The mm. dance bands, E.T. Mensah and the others, were modeled on a jazz or European yeah. symphonic or orchestral mm. structure, more. But of course they were African, but, there was, but the, the, the most African of all are the guitar bands because the guitars were organized like drums, mm -hmm. and also they didn't use verses, they used proverbial speech yeah, yeah. And, and philosophical stories. Yeah. So they, they were, so, so it was, I thought that probably that's why when I, the first bands I ever played with in Ghana were guitar bands, and it was my luck mm. to, to do that because I met, met, what I didn't realize is they had organized the guitar music in a guitar band, so that it was more or less equivalent to the drums in a traditional drumming group. Yeah. And so I met, met a very ancient form of philosophy. And then much, much later I've realized that this demo democratization of voices, not mm. follow the leader, but the, yeah. is the most advanced form of music for the world. Mm. Because um, everything, if you have a society that pretends to be democratic, and then its music is tyrannical, you have a superstar, mm. I call a superstar or virtuoso, Mm -hmm. Tyrants, or a great maestro, or somebody who writes down yeah. it on paper. Um, you, you've got to allow improvisation, the human spirit. Yeah. You see, and the most, at the moment, the, one of the greatest forms of music for this was traditional African music. But some of it's been transferred into um, modern music. And if you take Afro beats, what's very interesting about that's going on is the polyphonic layering of the different voices yeah. and instruments. Yeah. They're also going back. Yeah. But they're not saying they're going back to the past. But they're doing it instinctively because maybe a society that has a music that's been going on for a thousand years, it gets into the genetic system. And the youth will be using different names, but the genes yeah. are ex the musical genes are expressing yeah. themselves. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's a lot of things going on in Afrobeats. Uh, Afrobeats are exploring, with, uh, exploring high life music. You hear high life in it sometimes. Yeah. 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 Uh, they're using mm. pigeon English, pigeon English yes. yeah, yeah. which is now become a, it will be the next universal language, yeah. like yes. Black American or Patois. Yes, that will be the next one. Yeah. I'm telling. Yeah. You, I mean, yeah. pigeon is mm. definitely because yeah, yeah. Afrobeat is carrying it. Yeah, to yeah. that universal. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Prof, um, how do you feel? I, I want to tap into your emotions a little bit. Oh, okay. How do you feel when people like us? When, you know, students, when, you know, people in the arts, when they come to you for some of your brain, like, genuinely, how do you feel? Um, we're very happy. You see, how can I put it? When, during the 90s, you know, you know I formed this thing called Batmuff, which is a sort of mm -hmm. a museum mm -hmm. yeah. For, yeah. for high life and popular yep. music. And it was created by me and E.T. Mensa, um, Kwa Mensa, Konimo also was involved, King Bruce, some of the great names. Yeah. We formed the thing in 1990 because we thought that music, old time high life was gone. Yeah. 
Of course, hip life hadn't quite come by 1990. Hip life started a little, couple of years. Yeah. But we had the burger high life. Um, and we, we suddenly saw that the audience was changing, their tastes were changing, and nobody wanted to hear old time high life. Yeah. So that's why. Um, then we went through a period, then hip life came, which also the youth weren't interested. You know, the original hip life, they never used any traditional. There was no um, Panji Anoff trying to get um, uh, the, 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 this Kologo player. Uh, uh, Atongo. Yeah, not the uh, King oh. Ayasoba. Ayasoba. Ayasoba, yeah. yeah. That, that came later. Yeah. So the early hip life was just based on American beats, really. But, but uh, I mean, with, with Red Rock Stone's first album, Rab was sampling, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. from. Yeah, he, he, but, but Reggie was exceptional. Mm. Um, he was the pioneer, but many of the others were just boring American mm. hip hop beats and so on. Yeah, yeah. It took quite a long time. Uh, so it looked as, as if High Life was finished, you know. I mean, the number. Yeah. So that's why we formed it. Um, so I, th at one point, if you read my book, High Life Time, um, there's a chapter in it in which I call The Ghost in the Musical Machine. I got very despondent. Mm -hmm. um, look, look, I played it a show with, for Reggie Roxton. You know, I was in a, a High Life band. Um, this is around about 2000. Um, not, it was because I knew his father, Ricky Osei. So there was this big show at Kaneshi in which myself and Nana uh, Abiyam from Pan African yeah, Orchestra, yeah. who both knew his dad, we opened the show as old timers, you know. Mm. And the youth, there were about four or 5,000 hip life youth there, well. were not happy. So we survived uh, because, <laughs> the, because the singer, we had a song written by a guy called Aaron Bebby, which, oh, we, yeah, know, yeah. yeah. Know, shall, shall. Very, it was just luck that we picked a song where it has a very good catchy phrase about giant, uh, was it, um, Dry corruption. Yeah. So we're able to convince half of the youth to sing along with us, who were able to stop the other half shouting at us. Uh, yeah. And then Nana Danso came with a Pan African Orchestra. Oh. He didn't stand a chance because there's no words. So mm. Re Reggie had to stop and then allow the hip lifers. And every single hip life show, including people I knew like Shasa Ma Mali, Shimon, yeah. who's a good singer, Very. were doing miming. Every single blessed person was miming. And Nana Danso and the others were sitting upstairs, scratching our hair. What is going on? They don't even have a single life, I don't know, completely mimed. And then we no I noticed another thing that also shook me, that they weren't dancing. There's no dance for hip life. Yes. Yeah. They weren't dancing. They were jumping up and down at the stage, uh, adoring the, the latest fashion or, or singer. But the so I felt a very negative energy because hip life at that time was still basically um, based on hip life or hip hop beats, funk, yeah. which you, uh, you can't not dance to. But these guys had decided that it's not the done thing. The old people dance, so we're not going to dance. Mm -hmm. The old people perform life, so we're not going to perform life. So I felt a very negative energy and about an hour or two after the older people, myself and Nana, everybody left, there was a major riot. And I thought, in a twinkle of an eye, Africans who have been working out music and dance therapy for the last 10,000 years are going to throw the whole thing away mm. with this youth. And I got very low despondent because I couldn't believe this ha happened so quickly. Yeah. But what's happened? Everything has come back to normal. It was a phase. Yeah. You yeah. see? So... During that period, you know, I couldn't have a conversation like this with anybody. Nobody. A Ghanaian. Mm. Except Panji and Pake. Yeah, and Pake, a few. Charles, Charles Pake. Just a few yeah. handful of thoughtful people. Most of the hip lifers were not interested, anybody who was old, because yeah. there was this rejection going on. Um, but. It's like I say, with the museum now, I get so many young people. It's the, it, it, it's the reconnection between the grandfather generation. You're, I'm like your grandfather. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what's happened. You see, if I'm your father, you and I might fight. Yeah. So trouble with your family. Yeah. Even a girl might fight with her mother. But your grandparents, somehow you can have a more easy relationship. 
Um, so that's what I'm seeing now. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the big reconnect. Yeah, nice the youth nice. now. So I'm always very happy because once you can capture your grandparents' thoughts, not your actual grandparents, but that generation, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you can't lose anything. You'll be back to normal. You'll be yeah. normalized. The problem will occur if you create a society and follow the American life mm -hmm. of getting rid of your grandparents. Yeah, yeah. Then what do you do? Yeah. Or maybe you leave it too late and your grandparents have gone and you disconnect, let's say, your another, supposing your generation had also not been trying to reconnect, but one after you, there'll be, there, there's nowhere oh, to turn yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. It's only you, and the, some people, the Americans or the British will say, ah, oh, you don't really need grandparents. You can put them into old age homes and so on because you can always read books. But, but there's certain things in life you can't read in books. Yeah. It's how to yeah. get on with other human beings, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. And you need the family to have extens extensions, extended family, aunties and aunts, and the grandparents to give the family depth. Yeah. And, and this is one of the reasons why America and Europe are perishing. They've got rid of their grandparents. Mm. They haven't killed them off, but they've, they've got nothing to... In fact, in America right now, the average family in America is not even a nuclear family, man, woman, and two children, or whatever. It's a single parent mm. family. That is the norm now in America. Mm. So a child is brought up by not two parents, and grannies and aunts and so on. It's just one person. It's very, very bad, yeah. you mm. know? So, but the Americans will say, well, we don't need them because we've got books. Mm. Fine, read your books and see where you will end up, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you wound up discussing family. I had two questions I was debating in my mind, but where you took it has uh, decided for me what to ask um, of you. I know you have a wealth of knowledge. You've lived quite an interesting and uh, fulfilling life from, from the outside looking in. And a lot of young people, sometimes what Mutombo and I try to do with the podcast is to try to find that bridge of things that were taboo to discuss or opportunities that were lost. And you've touched on that, the grandfather connection. Mm. And so my question to you is generally on manhood. Um, how do you see your life's work in terms of legacy? And for us young men coming up, is there not like a silver bullet or a solution, but if there's one thing or a few things that you can tell us to watch out for in, in our quest to also become useful members of society that we can pass to the, to the next generation, what would you? Wow. It's a hard question, that one. I mean, I tend to be the type of person who would say, follow your own heart and be prone not to give you it. I mean, this is a conversation we're yes. having. Yes. Um, I'm always nervous about priests and self-appointed <laughs> cultural, yeah. cultural yeah. people who yeah. know all, or teachers, right. pedagogues. Um, because I, I, I would, I, the only thing I could say is that uh, you've really asked me a tough question. Um, mm. Because you see, in a sense, I can't give you an answer. Yes. Because the answer you'll find yourself. Mm. Um, it, it, but then, of course, you can always give people advice. Yes. Um, all right, one thing. Something I've noticed, not so much with Ghanaians, but particularly Europeans and American students, is that they're young people, about 20 years old. I was about that age when I, I was at university in Ghana. And they're already thinking about their old age and about their pension and about security and all of these things. Walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they call these people, but uh, I mean, I never went that way in life. Um, what I did was that, what I've discovered, in fact, if you want to know really, you know, I'm crabbier. Yeah. If, if, I've, if I if a nation, you know, yeah. the idea of fate or destiny. Yes. Yeah. I, no, I, I believe, in my case, I can only say my case, that things opened up for me in Ghana because I was in the right place at the right time. 
if I, if I did something similar in England, all the doors are shut. Uh, because it's a class society, it's already ruled by people for hundreds of years and so on. But what I noticed here is that if you follow your own heart or your own wisdom, taking advice from people, of course, you, things will happen. There's another name for it. There's a, there's a, a, a psychologist called Jung mm. who calls it syn synchronicities. Yes. Have you come across that? I know of Jung. I haven't seen the uh, philosophy of synchronicities. Um, synchronicities, it's coincidence. Okay. So, for instance, I'll be happening to stay with a guy who's a musician with E.T. Mensa, and through that, or I do this and something yes. happened. In other words, what you do is you keep an open brain. This is what uh, Jung also says. If you keep your brain very open, positive uh, incidents or connections will happen. And you may not understand them at the beginning. It, and some people would call it fate or destiny. Mm. He would call it synchronicity. Because practically everything I did in Ghana was almost my own will to do the thing was only one part of it. I was part of a bigger thing, of co and I could have just said, well, it's just a series of coincidences. Yeah. I just, my, my auntie Emma, my father happened to marry this woman, and I m happened to go there on a certain day, and this guy took me on a trek, and one thing led to another. But I've realized, in fact, that patterns emerge, but you have to keep an open brain. That's all I can say. Keeping an open brain, open yeah. mind. Yeah. Open mind, yes. yes. And okay. open to new ideas. And sometimes something will take you somewhere you think is completely irrelevant to what you, 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 you... And later on you'll find it's very important. Or a certain thing will turn you in a way which will surprise you later. Or a certain person you meet. Mm. Um, in other words, there's no rule book. And, and if anybody comes to you and they say they know the, that they know the answer to life, my advice is to run away from them. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. Appreciate that. Run away. Yeah. You have to run away, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, Fred. Yeah. Uh, we need Prof back. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'll tell you that. We have to get him yeah, back because, for sure. I mean, there, there, were, there were so many, um, I mean, there were so many questions that I, that I want to ask, ask him. But yeah, we, we actually need... Yeah, we covered quite a bit. Yeah. We did, and yeah. yeah. This, 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 this was, you know, the, you know, this was about the arts, you know, music. Yeah, I'm sure he has other sides that you know. So many from yeah, archaeological yeah, work yeah, he's yeah, doing yeah. to. Uh, we should definitely yeah, have yeah, Prof. Yeah, 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 definitely. So Prof, the, the next time we, we call on you, we, we know we know we know you are busy, but the next time we call on you. Well, you it's not it's not so far from yeah, my house. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And he even mentioned possibly bringing some of the students around oh, and stuff, wow. which yeah, would be no, kind of yeah, cool yeah, 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 yeah. idea no, no, to no, also no, execute. No, 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 so, no, no, Charlie, no, I'm dope conversation. I, and you're yeah. welcome to visit my house. I have an open air garden yeah. with lots of trees. I'm, I mean, being I, I, yeah. I've, I've, I've yeah, been to your house like okay. A of then, times. then you have to take me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have to. So I'm going I have to pick your brain. Yeah. Hi, Fred. Um, another solid episode. Yes, sir. You know, with. Professor John Collins. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. And guys, I, you know what to do. You for share the podcast. You for tell somebody about the podcast. You for leave us review, not just on YouTube, but Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you stream your podcast at share your thoughts share your thoughts if we there are, are questions that you also want us to be asking and stuff yeah, too we would love to we are open and so charlie you just for tell us you just for free your mind yeah. and fred yes sir the f more let's divide fred yes sir we are through <laughs> <laughs>